Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Jennifer Campos. I'm the Associate Director of Academics at KITE, and I'm extremely excited to uh, welcome you to this inaugural KITE three-minute trainee competition. Um, it's pretty amazing that so many people have joined today to support colleagues and to learn about the exciting uh, research being done at KITE. So uh, welcome and, and thank you again. Um, for joining. So um, as you know, uh, the Kite th uh, Three Minute Trainee Competition was inspired by the traditional uh, three minute thesis competition that takes place uh, around the world every year. Uh, the, the Three Minute Trainee Competition was a little bit more inclusive because we wanted to include graduate students as well as uh, postdoctoral fellows and staff uh, to communicate the key concepts of their research in this compelling uh, three minute presentation. So we know that uh, trainee talent is at the heart of kite research and has contributed in significant ways to rehabilitation sciences in application, including in the areas of uh, injury and illness prevention, restoration of function, and uh, allowing people to age well. Um, we also, you know, pride ourselves in conducting, you know, high quality research and advancing science and innovation, um, but the ability to communicate uh, that science is really what drives impact and, and motivates change. So having that ability to hone those skills and, and to be able to uh, share that with, um, with colleagues and non-scientists and the public alike is really um, a critical uh, skill set. Um, the, uh, this inaugural three minute, um, kite three minute trainee competition, um, like we said, it was the first one. We know that, uh, things are very different in the world right now. And, uh, we were looking for an opportunity to allow trainees to, uh, to network and to engage, um, and to, uh, and to be able to, uh, connect with people more broadly, um, in, in ways that we're not able to do in person right now. And so the kite, uh, three MT is this opportunity for kite research research to be showcased, recognized, and celebrated. So um, the top five, uh, the top 15 live finalists that you will hear today, and the top 15 Twitter presentation finalists that have been taking over the Twitter sphere for the past 24 hours, um, you know, serve to highlight some of the most exceptional interdisciplinary and collaborative complementary research that is being conducted across labs and sites at Height. Um, and I congratulate everybody uh, for this really Im important and significant accomplishment. Um, I'd like to also start with some acknowledgements. So there were many, many people that were uh, responsible for uh, conceptualizing and implementing this event. Um, if I say your name, I, I'd like you to have your video on and give a wave if you are present and have the ability to do so. I know some attendees are not. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank Miriam Pandy, who's really been a driving force of this event and has been working tirelessly behind the scenes for many months. Uh, so thank you so much to Miriam. Um, I'd also like to thank Kite's really phenomenal uh, and amazing trainee executive committee, um, particularly uh, Saya Bayat and, and Rabea Aryan for coordinating and planning uh, much of this event and to Hope uh, Gervais Redemeyer for putting together an excellent event handbook. Thanks to Talar uh, Nersessian for promoting the event. Um, also very, a, a very big thank you to our academic advisory committee and our abstract reviewers. And that includes Azadeh Yad Yadalahi, Tracy Kalella, uh, Sarah Muntz, Shiroz Khan, Tilak Duda, and Megan Adams. And of course, uh, we would very much like to thank our esteemed judges who include accomplished scientists and an award-winning journalist, um, all of whom are exceptional science communicators and advocates. Um, so at this point in time, I'm gonna take a moment to introduce each of them. We have three judges today. Um, originally, we had uh, Lindsay Lustig from ORT, who was supposed to be um, a fourth judge, but unfortunately, uh, Lindsay could not make it today and had to cancel. So I'm going to start off by um, introducing the judges by um, reading a brief bio for each, um, and then I'm going to uh, turn it over to them to say a few introductory remarks. So I'll start with Christian Cote. So Christian Cote is a special advisor for strategy and new media in UHN's public affairs department. Uh, one of his primary roles is writing and producing compelling print and emotive video stories 
about UHN doctors, researchers, scientists, and healthcare workers that target a mainstream audience. Um, I personally had the pleasure of working with Christian um, as he was producing and hosting um, the UHN's Behind the Breakthrough podcast series, which is about UHN researchers, uh, research and the people behind the research. Uh, he interviewed myself, Milos, and, and Kristen Musselman from Kite. It was a really wonderful experience. Um, that podcast uh, was nominated for several national awards, um, and Christian's been recognized widely for um, for, having, uh, for hosting and being such an instrumental part of that initiative. Um, prior to joining UHN in 2010, Christian was an award-winning investigative and sports television producer for TV networks, including CBC, CTV, the Discovery Channel, um, NBCSN, and APTN. So I'll hand it over to Christian if you'd like to say a couple of remarks. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, listen, first of all, to all of you, uh, huge props for the fact that you are dedicated and passionate about doing this kind of work. Uh, I, I think it's amazing. It's one of the reasons why I ended up joining UHN in the latter part of my career to help try and amplify what you do. I think it's so important and under uh, underreported. And second, to those of you who are presenting today, also props, I know it takes a lot of courage to do what you're about to do, but it's great practice and it's just, it's great for the discipline of being able to communicate what you do, which you're gonna be doing a lot of throughout your career. So good for you and have fun with it. Take a deep breath and go for it. Thank you so much, Christian. And thank you for, for spending the time with us today. Um, our second judge is Elisa Grigorovich. Elisa is a CIHR health system impact postdoctoral fellow at Kite. Um, her research program is broadly focused on health equality, aging and stigma in home and institutional care settings. And a key focus of her work centers on the ethical, social, and policy dimensions of implementing artificial intelligence and other types of technologies in care settings. And Elisa has really been, um, you know, a hugely um, uh, productive and very um, generous uh, sort of supporter and mentor to Kite trainees over the over the past uh, many years, actually. And so we're thrilled to also have Elisa as a judge on the panel today. So I'll pass it over to Elisa to say a couple of words. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to be a judge here. It's such a wonderful opportunity. And I'm particularly excited to hear and see the really engaging and creative ways that all the trainees are going to use to showcase their work. Um, I think it's really wonderful opportunity to be able to practice your communication skills, but really also sharing your scientific knowledge beyond both the physical and in some sense, the virtual walls of Toronto Rehab at Kite. Excellent, thank you so much. Okay, and our last judge is Dr. Jeff Fernie, who many of you know. Uh, Jeff is the former Institute Director of Toronto Rehab, and he's really the visionary who brought Toronto Rehab research to life, um, and, and who conceptualized and built uh, Kite's world-class simulation facilities, the Challenging Environment Assessment Lab. Uh, he currently holds the Cregan Family Chair in Prevention and Healthcare Technologies and is appointed at the University of Toronto in the Department of Surgery and uh, the Institute of Bio Biomedical Engineering. Um, Jeff's research is broadly focused on preventing accidents and illness, including falls, road accidents, and hospital-acquired um, infections. Jeff has been widely recognized for his achievements and contributions to science and innovation through many awards, including as an inductee to the Order of Canada and a recipient of the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. Uh, Jeff was really um, the one who prioritized the art of succinctly and effectively communicating your science when he instituted the Toronto Rehab Research Day Minute Madness presentations that have really been a cornerstone of the annual research showcase for years. And so we are really thrilled to have you here today. So Jeff, would you like to say a couple of words? I would. Um, Jenny, I'm so grateful for you and Miriam and the whole team um, continuing to emphasize both the uh, continue to emphasize efficient communication. I think it's becoming more and more important. Um, I just love what you've done this time and uh, I look forward to the rest of the afternoon. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, so now I'm gonna review uh, the timeline for the event today, just to go through kind of the order of how things are gonna proceed. Okay, perfect. So um, following the uh, 
the opening remarks, we're going to have the first round of presentations that is going to last for about half an hour. Um, then we're going to have a break. So during that break, you can have time to get up, use the washroom. We're going to have a little, I think, a mindfulness moment uh, for the first five minutes. And then we encourage you to come back after the first five minutes. And uh, Jeff is going to announce the winners of the Jeff Rooney Impact Awards. Um, following that break, we're going to have the second round of presentations that will go from 255 to 325. Um, after, uh, after which we are going to break again. That will be the end of all of the presentations for the event. Um, during that break, we'll have another opportunity to stretch and, uh, and, and, uh, and do what you need to do and, and kind of um, prepare for uh, the, the announcement. Um, during that break, uh, we will also have an opportunity. We're gonna do a little interview with Christian that, um, that Miriam's going to moderate. And so uh, at that point, if you have any questions for Christian about scientific communication or anything else, that would be an opportunity for you to ask him. So we'll have a little Q&A at that point, but um, very important is that, that that is also when the People's Choice Award um, will be opened. So as the audience, uh, one interactive component of what you're going to be able to do is that Miriam will launch a poll once all presenters have completed their presentations and you will be able to choose uh, your People's Choice Award uh, winner. So um, after that, uh, we are going to turn it over to the judges for the award announcements and the closing remarks. And then if you registered for the trainee networking session, I will turn it over to the trainee um, executive committee who has coordinated that whole event and they will give instructions on, on what to do next for those of you who, uh, who signed up for that. Okay, so I think that is all I had to say for the opening remarks. I will pass it along to Miriam, who's going to go over a few additional details and some housekeeping rules. Thank you, Jenny, for that wonderful introduction. So uh, just I wanted to say hi to everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. I know a lot of you helped us put this event together. So thank you. And we're really excited to hear today from our wonderful trainees about their research. And um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Marian Pandy. I'm the Academic Initiatives Lead at KITE. And uh, Jenny and I will take turns hosting today's event. So I'm just gonna go over some uh, basic housekeeping rules for today. Um, it is, uh, it is possible for you to engage with our event today and it's encouraged. So um, one of the things you can do is uh, use the chat box. So if you go to your chat box right now, you see that you have a few options. You can either send a message to everybody, including the attendees and panelists. You can uh, send the message uh, to me or Jenny if you had some um, technical difficulties or questions, we will be happy to answer those. But throughout the event and throughout the presentations, if you want to support somebody, if you like somebody's presentation, definitely feel free to uh, give them support in the chat box and let everybody know that uh, you're supporting that specific presenter. You can clap for them, you can show your support in many ways, and you can choose the option to uh, make your comment public to everybody. Uh, but if you had some technical difficulties, if you had some specific questions for me and Jenny, you can choose that option from the drop down menu and just send a private message to us. The, there's, there should be a Q&A option for you at the bottom of the Zoom bar. So um, this part uh, comes later when we're doing the interview at the end with Christian. So we'll have some questions. We will be talking with Christians about his thoughts on science communication. But if there are anything we didn't address, the talk is going to be short. So if you have questions for him, you can definitely uh, type those questions in the Q&A box. And I will be reading those out to Christian and we'll get his thoughts on that. Another way you can engage with um, the event is the People's Choice Award. So once everybody is done uh, presenting, I will be, or like one of uh, our trainees will be sending a um, Google form in the chat box for you to uh, choose the person you uh, like the most uh, as a presenter. You can vote for them. The voting pre period is gonna be very short, 10 to 15 minutes. So make sure you get your vote in uh, right after uh, all of our presenters are done presenting. 
And then after the event, uh, we will be sending a post-event survey to get your thoughts on how you thought the event went. Um, so I actually saw some questions. Yeah, so you are, your ca camera's muted and your, um, you, you're muted and your camera's off, but definitely use the chat box to show your support to the presenters that uh, you like their work. Um, just a, a little note to our judges. So all of our presenters have the same rubric as you do, and uh, all of them have been advised on uh, the importance of all the points, the comprehension, the communication, and the engagement. So I'm actually going to move. Okay. Yeah. So um, they have been advised on that, and they have had a training session with us. So just so you know, they are on the same page as you. So the way it's going to go, we're going to have the first round of presentations with the first eight presenters and Jenny will be moderating that. Then we'll have a little break and uh, Jeff will announce the uh, Jeff uh, Fernie Impact Awards. And uh, afterwards we'll have the second batch of presentations. And then afterwards we'll open it to uh, the interview with Christian, give judges to kind of calculate their final scores and open it for uh, all of you to participate uh, and choose our People's Choice Award. By then, the Twitter challenge results will be in. So we will be introducing the winner of the Twitter challenge uh, by then as well. So uh, with that, I think I'll hand it over to you, Jenny. OK, great. So I would ask that all judges make sure that your mic is muted. Um, I think that is true for everybody. I think Jeff just needs to mute. Perfect. And I would ask that all finalists who are not presenting at the moment, please also turn off your videos and mute your mic. Uh, the first presenter who's up is going to be Jackie. So Jackie can keep her video on. And, uh, and I think we, I'm going to share my screen. Just, uh, sorry, Jenny. Nissen, are you there? Because uh, Nissen is going to be the person who is the timekeeper for the first half. So, yes, thank you. Yes, so uh, all of the presenters, if you want to pin him so that he's at the top for you or just adjust your view so you can see him, he will be holding one minute and 30 seconds. Yeah, marks. So you will know, you can, um, you can uh, time yourselves too, but we'll be offering that throughout the presentations. And then for the second half, Saya will be do doing the same. Okay, and I'm just going to ask Gong Kai, can you uh, turn off your video, please? Perfect. Okay, it looks like we're all set. Okay, take a deep breath. Jackie, are you ready? Yes, I am. Prepare to share my screen here. Okay, I'm going to do this and then I will switch, swap. Sorry. Okay, how does that look, Miriam? Looks good to me. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, kicking it off with our first presentation Does increased gate variability improve stability when faced with an expected balance perturbation during treadmill walking? Jacqueline Mistico. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I am so excited to be here today presenting my thesis work. This is my first three minute competition. So let's see how it goes. Now you're probably wondering why I just spoke with such variable volume and speed. Variability during my, with my speech may not be the best for my performance. Variability during walking, however, may be a strategy to maintain performance and more specifically improve stability, which is what my thesis project aimed to understand. Research has demonstrated that when a perturbation or threat to stability is imposed while standing, increased variability before the perturbation can improve stability after the perturbation. It has also been speculated that variable movements while standing may be an exploratory strategy to obtain vital information about the environment. It is unknown if such findings translate to walking. 
we recruited 16 young, healthy adults who completed treadmill walking trials in a motion lab, seen in image A on the slide. Step data was collected using motion capture cameras and markers that were placed on participants, seen in image B, which also shows a participant completing a trial within the motion lab. All participants completed two trial conditions, seen under image A and B on the slide, experimental, where participants anticipated a threat to stability that was delivered by moving the entire motion lab, and control, where participants did not anticipate a threat to stability. Our main finding was that participants displayed increased variability during walking when anticipating a threat to stability compared to typical walking or not anticipating a threat. We found no significant effect of the increased step variability pre-perturbation on stability post-perturbation. The increased step variability that participants exhibited in anticipation of a perturbation may indicate an exploratory behavior because in theory, they would receive enhanced information if they vary their foot placements. Aligning with previous similar research, the increased step variability may simply reflect a healthy optimal state since it did not impede performance and participants were able to complete the task in the presence of the increased variability. Thus, the increased variability allowed for flexible and adaptable movements. These findings can help us to interpret variability that older adults display while walking, where perhaps the increased walking variability that they exhibit is outside of the optimal state depicted with the inverted U on the slide, resulting in a noisy, unstable system that is less able to adapt to threats to stability, perhaps resulting in greater risk of falls. Our findings demonstrated that young, healthy adults increase their step variability in anticipation of a perturbation or threat to stability. And while this appeared to reflect an optimal state of variability, allowing participants to maintain their performance, it had no effect on stability in the present study. Thank you for listening. Excellent, thank you very much, Jackie. I'm gonna give the judges a moment to reflect and enter their scores. Again, a reminder that you can uh, put your comments in the chat box or if you wanna show support or anything, uh, all the uh, panelists and the audience can do that. Okay, so I'm gonna ask Jackie to turn her video off and we're gonna move on to Shilpa. Perfect. Okay, for our second presentation titled Real-Time Minimum Foot Clearance Estimation Using a Wearable System, Shilpa Jacob. Shilpa? Yeah, is the slide showing? Oh, I'm so sorry. Hang on. It is here. I'm one behind. There we go. Thank you. you know that feeling when you're walking on a sidewalk, maybe texting a friend or listening to music, when suddenly you trip over your own feet and almost fall flat on your face? If you are a young, healthy adult, you probably remember that feeling of panic as your body was tumbling forward and then feeling relieved that you were able to catch yourself before getting seriously hurt. This is unfortunately not the case for the elderly man shown at the top of your screen. This is Larry. Larry is a 76 year old who lives alone and who loves going for walks around his neighborhood every evening. Sadly, Larry suffered a bad fall last year, which took many months to recover from, and now he has lost all confidence in going for his evening walks. Larry shuffles his feet when he walks, barely lifting his feet off the ground, which is what caused him to trip and fall. The main reason for tripping is having a low minimum foot clearance, which is the smallest distance between the foot and ground as the foot swings forward while walking. Studies have found that increasing the minimum foot clearance and providing real-time information about the way a person walks can reduce their chances of tripping. My research aims to create a novel wearable system that can be attached to any type of shoe that uses motion sensors, pressure sensors, and distance sensors to analyze a person's walking pattern. 
This allows us to detect key features such as their minimum foot clearance, pressure at the toe and heel, foot orientation, and foot velocity. So how does the system work? When an older adult wears the system, it is able to detect the walking characteristics specific to that individual after monitoring their initial 50 steps. By learning the way they walk, the system is able to predict if their minimum foot clearance will reduce in their upcoming steps and will alert the user either through auditory or tactile feedback, such as a buzzer or vibration, to raise their foot in their next steps to increase their foot clearance and as a result, decrease their chances of tripping. This research is very unique as it uses artificial intelligence and combines data from three types of sensors to estimate the minimum foot clearance in real time with high accuracy, which has not been done before. This system can also be used as a tool to prevent falls from happening in the first place, rather than just being used as a rehabilitation tool. My hope with this research is that older adults, such as Larry, will no longer have that fear or anxiety of tripping and injuring themselves, but can regain their confidence and feel safe doing the things that they love. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, we'll just give the judges another moment to record their scores. Again, a reminder, feel free to use the chat box, anybody who's in the audience. And just uh, if you want to send a, send a message to everybody, choose panelists and all attendees. Otherwise, only panelists be your um, message. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, we'll move on to our third presentation titled Traumatic Brain Injury, Sex, Gender, Functioning, and Disability by Anai Bronwyn Lloyd-Jones. Thank you. How can we capture sex and gender differences in traumatic brain injury? Today, I'm gonna to share how we did this with Ontario men and women. We know that traumatic brain injury is a major cause of death and disability worldwide. Emerging sex and gender trends in medicine have reshaped the functioning of healthcare research and practice. Recent breakthroughs affirm that sex and gender sensitive research has been advancing health sciences. Introducing explicit considerations of these interconnected terms of sex and gender and traumatic brain injury research may lead to a better understanding of the differences of functioning and disability in men and women. But which framework to use was the question that arose. I came to the Kite Research Institute as a research trainee as a part of the Bio 400 undergraduate program at the University in Toronto, Mississauga. I researched and came across the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, known as the ICF. This is an internationally accepted framework which encompasses the domains of body functions and structures, activities and participation, environmental factors, and personal factors. This model captures a coherent view of the different components of health from a biological, individual, and social perspective. We uncovered suggested variables in each domain which comprehensively described and measured a spectrum of limitations of the functions of persons with traumatic brain injury. This is exactly what I needed. We had data of Ontario men and women with mild and moderate to severe traumatic brain injury with, re, with mild and moderate to severe were undergoing rehabilitation and who were interviewed to understand the gender nature of their injury and recovery. We mapped the results based on injury severity. In the domain of body functions and structures, we saw that women with mild traumatic brain injury, injury suffered from more complete to severe impairment of pain status in comparison to men with mild traumatic brain injury and women with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. In the domain of participation and activities, we saw both severe to complete impairment of recreation and leisure and family relationships for both injury severities and sexes. We saw no differences amongst men and women of both injury severities for personal and environmental factors. In the future, we will continue to capture the effects of gender, such as relationships, societal norms, responsibilities, and um, responsibilities of men and women in their environment and how personal factors may shape their environment long after injury. 
What does this mean and why does this research matters? Well, this research matters because failure to acknowledge the differences between men and women and traumatic brain injury will mean that the rehabilitation and care will be gender blind. But we all know that the norms, relationships, and responsibilities of men and women are not the same. And when we can capture these differences in a standardized matter, we add to the evidence of a need of gender transformative medicine. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Anai. Okay, we'll just give the, the judges a moment to record their scores. And again, feel free to use the chat box to everybody who's just joining, show your support. Reminder to address it to all attendees. Okay. So we'll move on to our fourth presentation. The utility of vowel articulation in assessing the pharyngeal airway of sleep apnea. Shumit Saha. Hello, everyone. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. So if we have to go for the surgery for any reason, we will be given so many questionnaires to fill out. And one of them is for screening of your sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a respiratory disorder that occurs during sleep. It happens due to the collapse of the pharynx and stops our breathing. So why would we need to screen sleep apnea before performing any surgery? It's because some of the operations required to give full anesthesia before the surgery. And full anesthesia sometimes leads to mortality in sleep apnea patients. But the problem is questionnaires are highly subjective. Also, it is vital to understand the underlying anatomy of sleep apnea. Currently, it can only be done by MRI or CT scan, which are costly and often not accessible. In my PhD, I propose to use vowel articulation as a tool for screening of sleep apnea and assess the underlying anatomy. It's because tongue plays a very important role in vowel articulation. For example, when we say the word C, where the prominent vowel is E, our tongue moves forward and widens the airway behind. And when we say the word like sa, our tongue moves backward and uh, it narrows the airway. In our experiment, we ask the individual with and without sleep apnea to articulate the word C and sa. While they were articulating those words, we measured the airway diameter using the ultrasonography. In the figures, the blue and red represent the control and the sleep apnea group. And each line shows the change of our measurement from C to SA. From the ultrasonography, we found that the variation of the airway diameter from C to SA was significantly lower in the sleep apnea group. And this result can be, can be interpreted as the less movement of the tongue during sleep apnea. Also, we recorded the vowel sounds and extracted some acoustic features. We found that the variation from those features follow the exact same trend of our ultrasonography finding, which provided the proof of concept that the acoustic feature of vowel sounds can be used as a tool to assess the pharyngeal airway dimension and screening of sleep apnea. In future, we could incorporate this technology into a mobile application. The mobile app could be used as a quick screening tool of sleep apnea, where a person says some words and get his sleep apnea information. It can be easily used before conducting any surgery. And physician can use this app to preliminarily screen the sleep apnea patient, which reduces the overall cost of sleep apnea management. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shumit. Great. Okay, so we'll just wait a minute. Feel free to share your, your comments, your thoughts, show your support in the chat box. Reminder for everybody um, on the panel to mute your mics unless you are the next presenter. Okay. So, Emily, can we, there you are. Okay. 
All right, so we'll move on to presentation number five. Um, employing art for knowledge translation, visualizing effects of sex and gender in traumatic brain injury uh, by Emily Taylor. Storytelling and characters can be used to entertain us, engage us, and sometimes to educate us. I once learned that the plot of great TV sometimes follows what's called the story circle. Today, I've drawn out the story circle of my project and I hope to share it with you in under three minutes. Um, every journey begins with a need. And for me, that need was to teach a general audience about the influence of biological sex and sociocultural gender on traumatic brain injury. This is a complex topic because there's potentially three new terms that need to be introduced and beyond that, how they're connected needs to be clearly explained. Um, additionally, in order for it to have lasting impact, it needs to be both engaging and simple. So my question became, what is the best way to fill this knowledge gap? And this is what I went forward with, hoping to find a solution. During my searching and finding phase, I had to learn a lot about the topics myself. Um, so I was lucky to be surrounded by kite researchers who are very well versed on the topic. And additionally, I learned communication strategies from the biomedical communications department. What I found were three pillars which I used to build the bridge to fill this knowledge gap. The first pillar was the use of multimedia. Engaging both visual and audio channels um, in education can help to engage two sensory pathways and uh, create a more robust mental presentation for the audience. Additionally, the use of narrative and graphics together creating animation can be potentially more engaging than static text and images. The second pillar I explored was the role of characters within story. Characters can be used uh, for the audience to see themselves in. Murray Smith, uh, wrote, a doctor of film, wrote an entire book about the role of characters as the center of emotional engagement for an audience. And the third and final pillar was the use of cartoon and illustration. Scott McCloud, a comic artist and theorist, explored the use of comics and education as a way to simplify a message by drawing the audience to uh, what is essential to the story. So using these findings, as you can see in my take section, what I created was a um, cartoon style animation that had three fictional characters who were used to tell their story of traumatic brain injury as it relates to sex and gender. And in my return section, you can see some of the stills from the final animation. Um, my hope is that this animation, it fulfilled the need that was given to me at the beginning of my journey. I also hope that it can return to the audience a new understanding of traumatic brain injury, sex, gender, and their connection. And I also hope that this can be added to a body of research that explores the use of characters, cartoon, and animation to explain topics in science and health to a general audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Emily. Just uh, letting everybody know that between the Facebook and the Zoom, we have now 99 uh, people who have engaged with this, uh, attending this meeting. So I'm just putting the zoo, uh, the Facebook link here for the people who didn't have a chance to register. If you want to share it with your friends, feel free to check out the TRI, uh, Facebook page and it's a live streaming there too. Thank you, Miriam. Okay. So we are moving along here. We are on to presentation number six. So the title of this presentation is a wearable video based system for measuring hand use after cervical spinal cord injury in people living in the community by Andrea Bandini. Thanks for the introduction. I'm gonna tell you a story and I'll use a fictional character, but this story resembles many other cases I've seen in my experience. John is a man living with cervical spinal cord injury. He can't walk, has difficulties moving his upper limbs. But like many other people with this condition, the main problem is in his hands. He wants to regain a functional use of the hands for eating, drinking, and doing most of the activities independently. To do that, he's doing a lot of exercises at home or here in the clinic at Linders, followed by OTs and physiotherapists. They observe how John manipulates objects and prescribe the best rehab exercises tailored to his needs. However, there is one big challenge in this story. John lives in North Bay, Ontario, and to come here in Toronto for a one hour visit, he has to travel seven hours every week. 
He could dedicate this time to his family, his job, not to mention the associated economic burden. My job is to shorten this traveling and develop technologies that can measure how people with cervical spinal cord injury use their hands at home for optimizing therapies. Our solution is an intelligent system that uses a wearable camera, like the ones you use on YouTube to film hikes or other sports adventures. Patients can put this camera on their head, like a helmet, and record their activities at home so we can see how they use their hands in their daily life. Also, patients can start and stop the recordings at any time, whenever they want, using a tablet so unwanted situations like other people in the scene can be excluded. To provide a summary of several hours of video recordings to clinicians, I developed an artificial intelligent algorithm that identifies how often people manipulate objects and carry out activities. And our results show that we can do that with a high accuracy. We also involved our end users in creating a web page where patients from home can upload their videos so we can see the progress made at home. This way clinicians can really understand if patients are using their hands more often or for instance, if they need to change a prescription to improve their performance. And all this with patients hundreds of miles away. Finally, it's worth mentioning that the wearable camera is the only technology that allows capturing hand object interactions in the context of the daily activities, unlike other wearable devices that can only record the hand motion. So thanks to this technology, we can now measure remotely if with a specific therapy, John can perform more activities independently, closing this loop maximizing the outcome and improving quality of life in people with cervical spinal cord injury. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Great. Okay, so we'll take a minute again, give the judges a chance to write down their, their thoughts. We're creeping closer to the the halfway point here. Bless you. <laughs> okay. So here we are moving on to presentation number seven. An exploration of level ground minimum foot clearance in older adults and individuals with pathological gait. A scoping review by Abdul Rahman Albachi. I'd like to tell you a story. This is Annie. Annie was walking one day when suddenly her toe caught on a sidewalk slab that was uneven. And just like that, she was on the ground. That fall led Annie to injure her shoulder and sprain her ankle. After a series of similar falls, her confidence weaned, leading her to restrict undertaking activities and even from leaving her house. What if I told you that this story is a reality for thousands of Canadians? In fact, every year, one in every three older adults experiences a serious fall, and half of those are due to trips. What's more, Falls are the leading cause of injury-related hospitalizations among older adults and cost the Canadian healthcare system $2 billion every year. Importantly, falls don't just affect older adults, but also certain vulnerable populations. So what can we do to prevent falls? It turns out that the amount we lift to our foot when walking can actually tell us a lot about someone's risk of falls. This is commonly referred to as minimum foot clearance. And while there is a lot of research on minimum foot clearance and falls, there lacked a review of these papers with the resulting repository of conditions that are especially at risk of falls. So our team decided to embark on a review of literature surrounding minimum foot clearance. We wanted to know what were the reported minimum foot clearance measurements in the literature in vulnerable populations, and what were the associated research methods. We reviewed over 1,500 papers, 43 master inclusion criteria. What we found was that conditions such as fatigued older adults, people with multiple sclerosis, people with transitively amputations who report trip-related stumbles, and people wearing slippers all exhibited lower minimum foot clearance. In terms of the research methods used in these studies, we found inconsistencies in walking speeds and even the method of defining minimum foot clearance. This made comparing absolute minimum foot clearance values among each other a challenge. 
this re this uh, the results also showed a lack of overground studies and exploration of portable measurement systems. My fellow colleagues and friends, it seems like now, perhaps more than ever, there is a need for strong, holistic, community-based care focused on allowing people like Annie live fulfilling, independent lives. My hope is that the discussions raised in this research will allow clinicians to analyze how people at risk walk in a real-life environment, allowing for false prevention interventions. I also hope that it will inform policy guidelines regarding curb thresholds and ultimately lead to the prevention of falls. And remember, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abdul Rahman. Great. Okay. Take another breath here. We will give the judges some, some time. Please take advantage of the chat box so that you can show your support and add some comments. Uh, we have but one presentation left for this half of the uh, event before we, uh, before we have a break. So we'll take a moment for now until we go to the next presentation. See, Erica is on deck. Perfect. Okay. So moving on to our uh, final presentation of this half of the event. Can extra games impact balance, movement confidence, and cognitive function among people with dementia or mild cognitive impairment? by Erica Dove. Who would have thought that exercise and games could be combined to support the well-being of people with dementia? This is important given that dementia is a chronic brain condition which involves progressive decline in many areas. Someone in the world develops dementia every three seconds. People with dementia have problems with balance, movement confidence, and cognitive function, all of which are linked to falls. In fact, People with dementia are two to eight times more likely to fall than older adults without dementia. Extra games, or games that you play by moving, can offer engaging and accessible exercise to people with dementia, potentially reducing the risk of falls. However, the effects of playing these games for people with dementia on balance, movement confidence, and cognitive function are not well known. To address this gap, my thesis explored whether a group extra game program could impact balance, movement confidence, and cognitive function among people living with dementia. To do this, I recruited 28 people with dementia and asked them to play a bowling extra game twice weekly for 10 weeks. Before and after the extra game program, participants completed two tests that measured their balance and cognitive function. They were also video recorded during the first, middle, and final week of the extra game program to measure movement confidence. These data were compared at the start and at the end of the study to look for any possible changes. At the start of the study, participants performed poorly on tests of balance and cognitive function, highlighting impairments in these areas. There were also many participants who had problems with their mobility and required assistive devices such as canes and walkers. However, participants' movement confidence during the extra game program was high at the start and did not change over time. Of the participants who completed the study, there were no significant changes in balance, movement confidence, or cognitive function. This suggests that the extra game program supported maintenance of their skills. Now, for the most important question, why do these findings matter? Well, first, this study showed that people with dementia can learn to use extra games and enjoy doing so in a group setting. This was seen through laughing, clapping, cheering, and friendly competition. In addition to enjoyment, participants were also confident in using extra games, highlighting the potential of using this platform to promote engaging exercise for people with dementia. This is again important given that exercise can prevent events such as falls. This study shows that extra games can potentially benefit people with dementia as participants did not decline over the intervention period despite their progressive diagnosis. Finally, this study highlights a need for more physical programs for people with dementia alongside programs for their cognitive problems. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Erica. Great. Okay, I'm gonna give the judges a moment. 
They'll have a bit more time on the break, but we'll give them a moment now before we move on. It was a fantastic, um, fantastic first half. Congratulations, everybody. Um, at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand it over to the trainee executive committee who is going to uh, engage us in a, uh, a break activity. So Miriam, did you want to say something before we enter into the break? Um, yeah, sure. First of all, uh, amazing, amazing uh, presentations. And thank you everybody for um, listening to the first half of the presentation. We're gonna have a little break, a little mindfulness break where Bia will uh, play us a video. And then we're gonna be back with Jeff, who's gonna introduce the winners uh, of the Jeff Bernie Impact Award 2020. And then after uh, five to 10 minutes, we're gonna be back with the second half of the presentations. Um, just a note that the People's Choice Award will be open after the last presentation is done. So stick around and um, we'll hope to um, see, the, uh, see the other presentations pretty soon. Thank you. So for those of you who are gonna leave your computer, um, we're going to resume again in about um, 15 minutes, I think, Miriam, is that right? Yeah, I guess like 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. 10 to 15 minutes, okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, Rabia, whenever you're ready. Sure, I'm uh, trying to share my screen. Can you see my screen right now? Yes, I can. Okay. You're muted, so we don't hear the voice. Can you hear now? Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Bancroft and I'm just gonna lead you through a three minute breathing exercise. So what I'll get you to do is just find a comfortable position, allow your gaze to go downwards towards something that's not moving. Close your eyes if you feel comfortable to do so and bring your attention to your breath. Allowing yourself just to notice how your breath is at this moment. As best you can, not trying to judge it or change it in any ways. Just allowing yourself to be present perhaps with the movement in your chest or your belly, or perhaps with the feeling of the air coming in your nostrils or your mouth and feeling it as it is released from your body. As best you can, trying to keep your attention on your breath Knowing that your thoughts may wander, you may go to future thinking or about past things that have already happened. But as best you can, with kindness, not judging, just allowing yourself to go back to your breath, noticing the air as it comes in and out. Just taking a few moments to connect with how that breath feels and how you feel in this present moment. Again, really trying not to judge or put any meaning to it noticing this feeling, how you are, how your breath is in this very moment. Mm -hmm. 
And then perhaps wiggling your fingers or your toes. And then choosing to open your eyes when you feel comfortable to do so. And coming back here to this moment, hopefully a little more centered, a little more connected to the present moment and your breath. And knowing that this is a state, this is something you can always return to when you just want to be focused a little bit more in the present moment and out of that, those thoughts spinning in your head. I hope this was helpful and I hope that you enjoyed it and that you'll join some of our meditations in the future. Have a very happy and healthy day. Thank you, Rabia. Um, so if Jeff is done uh, putting uh, in his scores, I'm gonna now invite him back to um, the stage. Thank you, Jeff. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Now, Jeff, take it away. Thank you, Miriam. I'm uh, delighted to have this opportunity to recognize these winners and honorable mentions. First of all, um, I want to say something about how I feel about Kite and Toronto Rehab. I'm proud that it's recognized as the world leader in rehabilitation research. I'm proud that we publish so many good papers. I'm proud of so many things to do with Toronto Rehab and Kite. But what gives me real goosebumps is when the students particularly are energized and motivated to do something that actually helps the world, helps people. I think that we have a moral and ethical um, imperative, particularly at the moment, to be using our energies um, and, and uh, as, as effectively as we can to help reduce the misery in the world. And I must say that it's easy to get depressed about the increased level of misery. Um, it's quite extraordinary. Everywhere from Beirut to, um, to, to Africa, uh, to here now with, uh, with the pandemic, people are, people are suffering a lot. And we've all had the privilege of having an education and the privilege of being able to um, do work that we enjoy uh, under our own control, largely, not being told what to do. Um, and I think, therefore, the opportunity to repay it to society through impact is so important. So I'm really proud. I'm really proud of Shabnam, Prame, and Naz. Um, each of the, the notes about each of you are um, exceptional, both in terms of the work that you've done to make a difference in important aspects of people's living, whether it be um, prevention, which as you know is where I, my heart lies, or whether it be rehabilitation, re-enabling re, re, re people to move around or be able to live uh, at home rather than an institution. But I also am very proud of Lazar and Jacqueline. Um, and, um, I'm sure the, the, the marking, the scoring was very close, but congratulations to all of you. Um, you give me goosebumps. This is why TRI, I think, and KITE are important. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for your inspiring words and um, congratulations to all of the win winners of the Jeff Verney Impact Award and the honorable mentions. Um, just uh, for everybody to know, uh, the two honorable mentions are also here today competing in the live event. So they are extremely involved with KITE and the research. So uh, I think we heard from Jacqueline and hopefully we'll hear from Lazar in the next half too. So I'm just going to give everybody maybe a minute to collect themselves and come back. 
and uh, we'll be starting in one short minute. And just so I know, Lazar, you're the next person. So um, maybe just get ready, have your mic tested and your video, okay, on, great. Microphone test. Yes, good, thank you. Thank okay. you, thank you, Dr. Fernie, for the kind words. Okay, so everybody else, make sure you're muted. Um, I'm just gonna, yeah. Okay. So um, without further ado, um, our next presenter, uh, Lazar Yovanovich, um, his title, uh, the title of his presentation is Brain Computer Inf Interface Controlled Functional Electrical Stimulation Therapy for Arm and Hand Rehabilitation After Subacute Spinal Cord Injury, a Feasibility Study. Whenever you're ready. Think about having a sandwich and orange juice for lunch. We use our arms and hands to do this and many other similar activities. Now imagine if you cannot do that because of an injury. This often happens to individuals with spinal cord injury and the recovery of these functions requires therapy. Functional electrical stimulation therapy or FEST is one of the most successful strategies for arm and hand rehabilitation. However, simultaneously, through studies, we noticed that for some people, FEST did not work. There was no response after the intervention and their ability to move arms and hands did not approve. Therefore, we wanted to test the feasibility of adding brain-computer interface as a solution to improve FEST and cover the gaps. Brain-computer interface, or BCI, converts brain activity into a control signal, which is then used to activate the stimulation. This new intervention, which we call BCI FEST, is shown in the central image. The patient in the blue shirt is equipped with the electrodes, and the therapist in the yellow shirt guides the movements. During a session, the therapist would ask the patient to attempt a movement. In this example, opening their right hand. While the patient is doing that, we monitor their electrical brain activity using the BCI and trigger simulation when we detect intention to move. We have designed and developed this system specifically for clinical application. And to the best of our knowledge, this is the first BCI FEST approach that simultaneously combines three important features. Number one, the BCI uses a single channel design, which allows for a quick setup in just 11 minutes. Number two, it has an average accuracy of 74% in triggering stimulation, which is impressive for a single channel design. Finally, number three, it enables practicing of complex movements, like eating, which may seem simple at first, but involves complex motions um, containing both reaching and grasping. In this study, we also collected information on the potential clinical effects of this new intervention in five individuals with subacute spinal cord injury. On average, each participant completed close to 30 sessions of therapy. At the end of the intervention, three out of five participants showed increased independence scores. And all five participants showed increased scores in functional assessment, such as an object manipulation test. In summary, we found that BCI FEST is safe and feasible, but most importantly, it is a promising rehabilitation strategy to help individuals with spinal cord injury enjoy their lunch again. Thank you. Thank you, Lazar. Thank you for the amazing presentation. So just for our audience, if uh, you wanna show your support in the chat box, feel free to do so. Make sure you uh, choose the all panelists and attendees options. Everybody can see your comment. And then um, I'm just gonna give our judges uh, a minute to kind of jot down their scores. And um, so Lazar, if you can mute and close off your video, thank you. And so our next, the next presenter, Nizva Javid, uh, the title of his presentation is Computer Vision for Detection of Anomalous Events in Long-Term Care. Nizva, are you there? Yeah, can you see me? Yes, we can, yes. And we hear you too. And Saya is doing the timekeeping, so she's there. And then I think we can proceed. Take it away. 
Long-term care facilities suffer from understaffing with a high resident to staff ratio. 70% of long-term care residents live with dementia and other cognitive impairments. Symptoms of dementia, such as episodes of agitation, aggression, and falling down frequently can be very challenging to manage under low staffing conditions. It could lead to neglect resulting in injuries and many other issues. These vulnerable residents require constant care and attention to ensure their well-being. So the question is, how can we assist the nursing staff in delivering quality care to these residents? In my research, I leveraged the use of existing surveillance systems installed in long-term care facilities to solve this problem. While these systems are intended to help staff observe residents, typically these video streams are left unmonitored. We believe video data can contain important spatial and temporal information. Therefore, we hypothesized to use novel computer vision algorithms on these video feeds to detect behaviors of residents that can put them at risk. To test our hypothesis, we started a study in November 2017 at Specialized Dementia Unit at Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, where we collected more than 600 days worth of data from multimodal sensors, including a wearable device and 15 video cameras placed in common areas of the unit. Since these risky behaviors occur rarely in comparison to the normal activities, we formulated our problem as an anomaly detection problem. We use specialized, unsupervised deep learning models to learn normal behavior of residents over a period of time and then use that model to test both normal and anomalous behaviors. My current results are very encouraging with an, approximate, uh, with an accuracy of approximately 75% in detecting these behaviors. Another insightful outcome of this analysis is that in addition to reported agitation, our model was also able to identify other anomalous events, such as crowd gathering at one spot or someone running in the unit, which may again put these residents at risk. Further development of these predictive models would allow the use of existing video surveillance infrastructure in long-term care, resulting in a low cost and non-invasive alternative to wearable technology. I strongly believe that our ongoing analysis will help us understand and identify scenarios that may trigger these risky behaviors among residents and design prevention strategies. Lastly, but most importantly, it will address the safety of residents by alerting the nursing staff in case of any anomalous activity taking place on the unit. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Nisba, for a wonderful presentation. So uh, I'm going to give our judges again a minute to jot down their thoughts and their scores. Um, meanwhile, feel free to use the chat box to show your support to Nisba. So um, I'm going to go to our next presentation. OK, so uh, the next presentation is titled, Are We Doing Enough? knowledge and information needs of care recipients and their impact on living with a pressure injury and by Sharon Gabison. Sharon, are you uh, there? Okay, yes. Yeah. So whenever you're ready, I'll take it away. Am I gonna stay on my side for the rest of my life? I just don't know what I'm supposed to do. I wish I could call somebody. I feel like I'm in jail. These are words and experiences shared by individuals who have had or have a pressure injury. Imagine living with these thoughts day after day. You are immobile. You have been warned about what can happen if you don't move. You have a problem that can kill you, but you feel so socially isolated as if you're in jail. You have no one to ask for help. Pressure injuries are also known as bed sores. They're not a popular scientific discovery that people talk about. They're an unwelcomed, unwanted complication that should have never happened. They occur from tissues that have been deformed due to staying in one position for too long. They're common in individuals who cannot move and who rely on their caregivers to help them either roll onto their side, lean forward in a wheelchair, or change a position in bed. These are costly and cause immense physical pain and suffering, not only for the person who has these pressure injuries, but also for the individuals who look after them. Individuals who are at risk of developing pressure injuries may be taught how to identify and prevent them. 
But do we really know what information they need and how they prefer to get that information? The study aimed to explore just that. We wanted to know individuals' experiences when living with a pressure injury, what they knew about them, and what they did once they had one. We interviewed eight individuals with real life experience on what they needed in real life. So what did we find? Well, when experiencing a pressure injury, individuals experienced anger, frustration, and sadness. They reflected on what they knew and what they wish they had known that would have made them do things differently. They wanted information that was practical and catered to their unique circumstances. Healthcare professionals may think that handing out pamphlets for pressure injury prevention is helpful, but these pamphlets mostly end up on a dining room table, in a drawer, or somewhere where they can't be found when needed. Being able to access this information electronically at your fingertips at any time is what's needed. Most importantly, individuals want to know what to do in the moment when they have a pressure injury, and they want to know that they are going to man what they're going to do to manage the rest of their activities because of their pressure injury. They want someone that they can turn to without having to wait weeks for an appointment or needing a referral. A hotline would be great. While they're receiving treatment for pressure injury, they learn what to do by watching what their healthcare professional does and listening to practical advice provided to them. Healthcare, healthcare professionals can use these moments of treatment as moments of teaching this can lead to less, less isolation, despair, and suffering. We're working on building these electronic resources and setting up a support network to help individuals and their caregivers living with pressure injuries. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I'm gonna just give the judges a few moments and also um, for the audience who wants to engage, make sure you uh, choose the all panelists and attendees so everybody can see your comments. Great. So we are on to our next presentation. Um, testing the effects of exposure and motion on simulated driving performance in younger and older adults. Rob Robert Novosholsky and uh, Robert, I see you're on whenever you're ready. It's a beautiful sunny afternoon as you drive your car up to the cottage. Captivated by the rugged Canadian landscape, you miss a sign telling you to reduce your speed. Suddenly, you encounter a valley and you get a sinking feeling as you reactively hit the brakes. You were driving too fast, but how is it that your body knew? This feeling is in part caused by the vestibular system, one of the many sensory systems that allows us to successfully judge our own movements while driving. The vestibular system is an organ in the inner ear that detects acceleration and along with vision and other sensory inputs gives us a reliable understanding of where we are, where we're going and whether we're slowing down or speeding up. However, just like vision, our vestibular functioning changes as we age, thereby changing our ability to perceive our movements through the environment. Adults over the age of 65 are quickly becoming one of Canada's largest demographic groups, making up to 20% of the population within the next 10 years. Maintaining mobility in old age is fundamental for living a healthy and fulfilling life, and over 55% of adults over the age of 80 continue to drive. However, older adults have a three times higher likelihood of being involved in a collision. While much is now understood about how other age-related sensory declines affect driving, the degree to which age-related changes in vestibular functioning affect driving is yet to be understood. Therefore, the goal of my research is to understand this relationship. We are very fortunate to conduct this research in Canada's most advanced driving simulator, Driver Lab, which consists of a real car surrounded by 360 degree projection screens placed on a six degree of freedom motion platform, which allows for the unprecedented ability to precisely and systematically stimulate the vestibular system in a highly controlled manner. We tested healthy younger and older adults who drove through three scenarios consisting of urban, rural and suburban environments while following the rules of the road. Participants drove in one of three conditions, no physical motion, rotational motion, which gives information about turns and curves, and full motion, which in addition to curves and turns, gives information about forward, backward, and up and down acceleration and deceleration. Our preliminary results suggest that older adults benefit more from the addition of motion than do younger adults. Furthermore, while older adults took longer to adapt to the stimulator early on, these differences got smaller over time of exposure, suggesting that older adults need more time to calibrate the processing of vestibular cues. 
Overall, this research helps us in better understanding age-related changes in vestibular processing and how it might affect driving performance. Long-term, this research may help in vehicle design as well as in optimally designing simulators for training and assessment purposes. Eventually, this will contribute to enhancing safe mobility in older adults and road safety for all. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much for that presentation. So I'm going to just um, give a minute to our judges. Uh, for the people who might have joined us later, um, after I think this is the 12th presentation. So after all of our 15 uh, presenters are done, we will uh, send you a link in the chat box for uh, People's Choice Award. And you can uh, make sure that you get your vote in. And um, I'll give you more instructions then, but just a heads up. Okay, so our next presenter. Um, novel method to reduce muscle fatigue during FES rowing exercise. Gangkai, yeah. Gangkai, are you on? Yeah, mic check, mic check. Yes, excellent. Okay. Whenever you're... We all know that exercise is good for you, but you and I have the luxury to choose not to exercise today. I know I'm not exercising today. However, people with spinal cord injury often don't have the same luxury to exercise even if they wanted to. As a result, cardiovascular and musculoskeletal decline are the two most common conditions that occur after these injuries, leading to higher rates of diabetes and bone fractures. Spinal cord injury is a reality for 85,000 Canadians and will be the new reality for someone every two hours. The goal of my research is to not only give these people an option for exercise, but also to maximize their exercise time. There are two problems that I need to overcome that I need to overcome to reach my goal. The first problem is that conventional physical therapy typically focuses on arm exercises and is not intensive enough to prevent cardiovascular disease. But we can generate involuntary limb movements with functional electrical stimulation. And by electrically stimulating and engaging paralyzed muscles, we increase exercise intensity. So if FES is applied to the legs in an exercise like rowing, the involuntary leg contractions from FES is combined with a voluntary arm rowing for an intensive full body exercise. Being able to exercise with a voluntary effort sounds great, right? Not so fast. The second problem is that FES causes rapid muscle fatigue and limits how long FES can be used for any given exercise session. This fatigue occurs because the order in which your muscle fibers contract normally is random. But when FES, it forces all the muscle fibers to contract all at the same time. My solution then is to mimic the random activation patterns we see naturally with spatially distributed sequential stimulation or SDSS for short. By comparing SDSS in FES rowing to, tr to traditional stimulation, uh, we can see how much SDSS actually delays muscle fatigue. Preliminary data is very, very promising. SDSS can delay muscle fatigue and rowers exercise for much longer before fatiguing when compared to traditional stimulation. As a result, these rowers ex uh, exercise more in a given session, burn more calories, and perform much more higher intensity exercise than current exercises can afford, improving their cardiovascular health and increasing their bone and muscle structure. If SDSS can decrease the fatigue associated with electrical stimulation, it would significantly improve rehabilitation efficiency and reduce the number of visits to a healthcare facility. With spinal cord injury having an estimated lifetime cost of at least $1.5 million, improvements to patient rehabilitation has a direct impact for both the patient and healthcare system, not to mention the physical benefits. With SDSS and FES rowing, patients can also have the luxury of choosing how and when they want to exercise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gang Kai, for the presentation. Okay, so our next presenter is getting ready. I'm just gonna give the judges a moment. We see some support in the chat box. Thank you, audience, for engaging. Okay, so our next presentation, uh, is this a prime time to accelerate the innovation process in evidence synthesis? An example from a, progn a prognostic review on the effect of infectious agent on cognition. Summit Dillon. 
Uh, Summit, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Um, I couldn't hear you very clearly. Can you hear me now? Um, is it better now? Yes, it is. Okay. okay. I'm going to just, whenever you're ready. I'm sure that many of you have either read, written, or will encounter a systematic review in the future. Recently, we have seen a shift towards evidence-based medicine. Now this has resulted in a vast number of available prognosis studies. But then how do we deal with this information overload? Well, one solution is to summarize evidence using systematic reviews. If you think about it, the whole premise of a systematic review is actually very appealing. You read one study instead of hundreds in order to make a decision. But like all things in life, there is a method to a systematic review and a huge difference between one that is done well and one that isn't. So as a part of my research, I am conducting a systematic review on the role of infectious agents on cognition. In parallel to this, I've decided to investigate the time and effort that goes into this process and how we can advance the systematic review process for best evidence synthesis. So now the inspiration for my research really came from a white paper calling researchers to hunt down an Alzheimer's germ. Also, with our current pandemic situation and the, and the fact that researchers are now proposing neurotropic mechanisms for COVID-19, my research becomes even more important today than ever before. So obviously, to begin, I needed a research question, and I went about this by defining the population, intervention, comparison group, outcome, and study designs that I would include. Now, formally, this is known as the PICOS process. I then partnered up with an information specialist at the Toronto Rehab Library Services to conduct my literature search. After removal of duplicates, I moved on to complete the first screening of citations. Now this involved reading the titles and abstracts of over 11,000 studies. But what I found was that only about 1% of them actually met my inclusion criteria. Now next steps are going to include a second screening by another researcher resolution of inconsistencies between the two screenings, a risk of bias assessment, and of course, summarizing and interpreting the findings. In terms of time, it took me over 136 hours for these initial steps, but that was just the beginning. Now, just imagine how much human power will be exerted in this review by the time it's complete. Now, it is high time that we do something about this. We urgently need to develop automation tools, such as through artificial intelligence, to speed up and reduce the burden on everyone involved in this exhaustive process. That way, instead of spending so much time on these easily automatable tasks, researchers can focus on properly assessing risk of bias, interpreting their findings, and judging the credibility of their results to ensure they are suitable for clinical practice. But for the meantime, let's give kudos to those who are embarking on these laborious systematic reviews. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. So before we move on to our last presentation, yeah, so uh, I'll give the judges just a second to jot down their scores. And then we will move on to the next one, the last presentation from today. Um, Navigate to Better Memory, an online spatial navigation intervention for individuals living with multiple sclerosis. Uh, Julia, I see that you are here. Great, whenever you're ready. Great, thank you. Uh, best for last, perhaps. Um, so uh, to begin, I'd like to ask you a question. How much can you tell about somebody just by looking at them? Memory impairment is an incurable and invisible disability that penetrates almost every aspect of daily life, from our morning commute to our hobbies, to employment and general independence and even self-esteem. As many as 75% of people living with multiple sclerosis experience cognitive deficits, particularly to their memory. Especially in the chronic phases of the disease, it is characterized by continuous atrophy or shrinkage of brain regions, including the hippocampus, an area that is critical to new learning and memory. Encouragingly, continuously novel, challenging, and stimulating mental exercises have been shown to benefit memory and protect the hippocampus from shrinking. Based on this previous research, our lab developed a 16-week online spatial navigation intervention for improving memory and staving off hippocampal atrophy. 
It is a self-administered intervention, requires minimal therapist oversight, and is accessible from a home computer, a tablet, or even a smartphone. The aim of our study was to evaluate the feasibility, or in other words, the practicality of this intervention, as well as uh, whether it actually helps to improve memory. So in a randomized control trial design, 16 people living with MS were assigned to either complete the intervention or to a no treatment control group. The intervention itself involved navigating unfamiliar cities around the world through a very popular platform that many of you have probably used called Google Street View. And they did so for one hour a day, five days a week for 16 weeks. Also hippocampus dependent memory was measured before and after the study. So far, results have shown that participants complete 98% of all assigned days, commenting that they found the intervention very enjoyable, challenging, but not too challenging, and rarely forgot to gave up or forgot the daily sessions. Some felt a sense of empowerment and independence to be able to virtually navigate on their own without the support or oversight of a caregiver. Efficacy findings are preliminary, but show meaningful improvements on hippocampus dependent memory after the intervention. Importantly, these tests generalize to memory benefits uh, in everyday life, which is something every intervention should strive to do. Overall, the spatial navigation intervention is promising, accessible, and first of its kind treatment that can help improve memory regardless of mobility restrictions, financial status, or concerns for infection risk, especially now in the times of a pandemic. Importantly, the intervention can be scaled up to increase treatment across the entire country, not only for multiple sclerosis, but any illness characterized by these, at times, invisible memory problems. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much for that presentation. And that concludes the presentation portion of this afternoon. So now that everybody has had a chance to present, I'm going to post the Google form for the People's Choice Award in the chat box. You should all, all be able to see it and, ex uh, and access that link. Uh, sometimes Google form doesn't really work with VPN. So if you can't really see the form, just try um, turning your VPN off. And the voting will be closed by 3.45. So uh, you have approximately 15 minutes to get your votes in. I'm going to, again, uh, I see some, uh, some uh, support from the audience. I'll just yeah, copy the uh, Google form again. Thank you to all of our presenters for this, their wonderful presentations. We are so happy to be able to learn uh, about your research. So our judges are going to take this time to kind of um, just come to conclusions. But now I'm going to turn it over to Rabia so that she can share a quick stretching exercise with all of you. Okay. Rabia, are you there? Yes, uh, I want to share, okay. Uh, just let me, just give me a second. I don't know why this, after the video, we'll be back with an interview with uh, one of our judges, Christian Cote. So st uh, stay on for that. If you want to just uh, take a break for five minutes, we're going to be back in five with Christian. And just a reminder that you should vote once for your People's Choice Award. It gives you an option to respond again after you submit your response. So just make sure that you're only doing it once. Sorry, please let me know. Can you see the screen? Yeah, we see it. All right, everyone. So here is a quick stretch routine that I like to do when I'm sitting down a lot, working on the computer, hunched over, start getting some of that tension in your neck and back. So here are four stretches you can do right at your desk, sitting down. We're going to start off with some desk cat cows. Usually this is done on all fours, but since we're at a desk, we're going to do it right at our desk, sitting in our chair. Hands out in front, sit up nice and tall here. And then in this position, we're going to tuck our chin and round our back. Once you're at this position, we're going to just reverse it. 
we're gonna look up and drive our chest out, trying to arch our back. We're gonna run through this 10 times. I'm gonna speed it up so I don't bore you to death. But let's do 10 reps, let's do it together, all right? reps desk cat cow now we're just going to go into arms overhead and arching back here arms overhead lean back just a little bit 10 times super simple if you have a back that goes up on your chair just scooch forward a little bit and then arch back a little bit okay 10 reps i'll see you guys in 10 reps Ten reps. Those two are great. It's gonna help mobilize our spine, get that spine moving. That last one, we're always hunched over. So what's the easiest way to get us out of this posture? It's going the opposite way. So those are the first two exercises you can do. And now we're gonna get a little bit of a side bend going. Our low back can get a little bit tight since we're always hunched over. So what we're gonna do here is take one hand to the outside of your chair, and then you bring this arm overhead. Then you're going to reach over this way, bending your body to the side. You get an awesome stretch right in that low back muscle, that QL muscle feels really good. So we're gonna hang out here and just hold this position. Let's just shoot for about 30 seconds on each side, breathe through it, and we'll do both sides. I'll see you guys in one minute total. seconds each side really stretching out that low back getting a whole stretch up the whole side action it's awesome let's finish up with t-spine extension with a little bit of rotation we got a little bit of that back and forth arching back a little bit of the side bend now let's get a little bit of rotation to finish up sit on the end of your chair and then scooch that chair back just a little bit elbows are going to be on your desk elbows on the desk Hands come to the back of your back. Back of your back. Yeah, sounds about right. And then from here, we're going to push our hips back and then sink our chest down. Once we hang out in this position, let's hold this for about 30 seconds. Get some good extension in the T-spine. And then from here, we're going to lift up one side. So lifting up one elbow and rotating towards one side. We'll alternate, chest down, alternate, keep that other elbow on the table, and we get some good rotation right in that mid back. I want you guys to do, let's do 10 on each side. Again, let's keep everything simple. 10 on each side, and I will see you in 20 total reps. is a quick little routine you can do at your desk especially if you have those long days working on your computer so give those a try thank you everyone Okay, everybody, sorry, we're back. Uh, another technical difficulty. But um, yeah, so I'm going to be sharing my screen now. Thank you, Rabia, for um, doing that, uh, sharing that exercise with us. I tried it a little bit and I feel refreshed now. Okay, so uh, this is our fun part of the evening. And uh, we're here for our interview with uh, Christian, uh, Christian Cote who has also been a judge. Thank you, Christian. I know you were busy uh, with all the judging, um, judging, uh, judging duties, but thank you so much for agreeing to 
do this interview with me. Absolutely. For those of you, uh, so uh, for those of you who joined us late, um, I'm just going to give a very quick bio on Christian. So Christian Cote is a special advisor, strategy and new media in UHN's public affairs department. One of his primary roles is writing and producing compelling print and emotive video stories about UHN doctors, researchers, scientists, and healthcare workers that target a mainstream audience. And he's the host of Behind the Breakthrough podcast. So this podcast is all uh, about groundbreaking um, UHN research and the people behind it. Prior to joining UHN in 2010, Christian was an award-winning investigative and sport television producer for TV networks, including CBC, CTV, Discovery Channel, NBCSN, and APTN. Thank you so much, Christian, for joining us today. Um, we are going to be talking about uh, science communication with Christian. So at this time, uh, if you want to pose any questions and, and while we're talking, if something comes to your mind, you can use the uh, Q&A box uh, on, uh, on the uh, Zoom bar uh, on your screen to pose any questions you want for Christian. We get the conversation started, but um, we're happy to um, pose your questions to Christian as well. Okay. So uh, thank you, Christian. Do you want to maybe add something to that? How was the judging experience just before we start? Uh, really impressed just with everybody, uh, their speaking skills and their confidence uh, and their passion for the work they have. And, uh, you know, personally, I was really glad to see, you know, a number of you used story to help communicate what you do, which is a, a big uh, sort of lesson that we always try and teach people is to use story. It's the most powerful way to get through to people. Um, you know, when was the last time you said some, to someone like, I, I saw a really good PowerPoint yesterday? So we always stress story at, at public affairs at UHN. Thank you, Christian. So uh, I'm just going to start uh, maybe by uh, asking you about your journey and specifically your experience with UHN podcast and science communication. Sure. Well, when I first came to UHN, uh, you know, one of my goals was to leverage the experience I had in terms of creating television shows. Uh, and, and one of the things I saw here that I said at the outset of our afternoon here was I wanted to increase the profile of UHN research. So we eventually landed over time on the idea of a podcast. We just we felt it suited the sensibilities of, uh, you know, it's, it's long form. It allows lots of time to get in, you know, get into the meat of a subject. Um, so we, we decided to embark and last year tried uh, an, 11, an 11 episode run uh, of, a, of a podcast for the season. And three of the TRI researchers were kind enough to uh, take a flyer on us um, and Always from the outset, the primary goal was to try and reach a primary, uh, to reach a, a mainstream audience. That was critical for us. We wanted to deliver something that's value added, so it had to pass the smell test of not being, you know, uh, branded and corporate. It had to bring value. So for us, the watchwords were we had to engage. It had to be revelatory, and we tried to tell a story. So we divided up the, the podcast and sort of to two halves. One dives into your work and why it's impactful and why it, you know we always relate it back to the patient and the back half is about all these sort of soft skills that people pick up along the way uh, of their careers the experience they build up that they don't teach you in med school or engineering school or biomechanics school it's all the stuff that you learn about failure how to deal with failure and resiliency and how you mentor people and how you inspire people and uh, getting into also just your personal motivation. One of the things I love talking about with people is their origin story, why they do what they do. And by and large, it's always something from early in life, childhood, teenage years. Uh, and, and they're fascinating uh, to, to, and it, in a way, this also humanizes researchers, right? Which is part of appealing to a wide mass audience is they aren't these people that toil away in you know, lonely labs they're real human beings that have 
uh, you know, strong motivations for why they do what they do. So that's, it's been a really fun journey in terms of producing the podcast. Hopefully it's uh, engaging to people. We've had uh, fairly good success, I think, in terms of viewership. We're not measuring ourselves against Joe Rogan's, you know, experience podcast, but uh, definitely uh, Brad Waters, who runs uh, uh, UHN Research, has seen enough in the show to uh, green light it for the second season. So we're underway with that. Thank you, Christian. Um, and I think um, it was very interesting that you said, uh, what was the last time you said to somebody, um, have, uh, have you seen a great PowerPoint? I, I've seen this great PowerPoint. Usually people connect with stories. Uh, okay. And uh, a lot of the time you hear about like good communication and science communication or other, um, you have to have this thread that kind of holds all the story together. And um, I guess what you say is that the person, the backstory is uh, just, uh, sometimes is just as important as the research itself when you're telling it to, a, uh, to an audience. Absolutely. So another um, question for you actually. Um, so what do you think is the importance of science communication in general, but more at this point in time? What are your thoughts on that? Well, look, uh, we, we live in interesting times. Uh, this is an unprecedented uh, juncture in history. Uh, and I think to me, there's an opportunity for all of us that operate in this sphere of medical and, and scientific research because there is an unprecedented focus uh, and appetite in the general public and political uh, spheres to read about medical research and science. Uh, it's, it's through the roof, right? And because of the pandemic, it's created a sense that, wow, like our daily lives are really important in terms of uh, relying on health research and medical research. So I, I think, you know, continuing initiatives like what you're doing today, uh, Jenny and Miriam are critical to helping communicate to a wider audience what you do making science accessible, making it also understandable so that, you know, people don't turn off after reading the title of a paper. Uh, making it accessible is really important. And on the flip side, you're also helping understand, people understand out there the rigor of science, that science takes time. This is not just snap your fingers and we've got a cure or a vaccine. It also helps people then further down, further along that line of thinking, helps them understand that you know, the process of science is based on testing a theory and you yield evidence and then there's more testing and retesting and you seek input. And as a result, science and scientists adjust their findings accordingly and quite often. And that's the kind of sources we should all be seeking when it comes to, uh, you know, pandemic times. People have really been, I guess, questioning why scientists are flip-flopping and that's not the case they constantly are learning and that's part of the process. So any way we can demonstrate that or communicate that, I think is really important. And finally, just helping people, like I said at the outset, understand that the foundation of healthy lives and healthy living is based on medical science and research. It's all of a sudden we have this spotlight on how important we are, just like the, uh, you know, the checkout people at at grocery stores and teachers, we're understanding also that medical researchers and scientists are critical to our healthy lives. And that in may in turn help people understand that we need to fund this kind of work. We need to resource it properly and we need to, you know, find financing and, and uh, underwrite research because it's all vital. Thank you, Christian. There are some questions coming in, so I'll uh, move on to my uh, to our next point, and then maybe read some questions for you. Okay. So, um, junior researchers have a lot on their plate, as you know. So, if you're like a PhD student, you have to take classes, run studies, analyze data, present, and write. So, um, how can they actually work on their communication skills when they're so busy, and how can they prioritize that? What is your advice for that? Well, look, first of all, I have to say from what I heard this, this afternoon and watched, you know, everyone uh, has great confidence skills, great speaking skills. I think, uh, you know, younger generations have way less, uh, you, you know, sort of hesitancy about putting themselves out there on camera because they've grown up with cameras all their lives and, been, you know, computers, that kind of thing. So it's great. Uh, 
There's no fear factor. It's about presentation. And look, don't reinvent the wheel. This is what public affairs at UHN is for. You have a number of people at Kite and TRI to help you. They're a resource to help you. Um, bigger picture, if there's enough uh, you know, critical mass in terms of a number of you seeking uh, input or, or guidance in terms of a, maybe a workshop, we, we do those. We have a traveling roadshow that will go across the network uh, giving uh, you know, an hour long workshop or a two hour long workshop, whatever you like, that's tailored to your needs. It's, it's interactive, you know, we'll present to you what we've learned and you can ask questions, that kind of thing. I mean, one of the biggest watchwords or pieces of advice we give people is you've got to, if, you, if you're going to do this, you have to commit to your audience and your audience are like Joe Sixpack, like me, you know, I don't have a science degree. I don't understand science. You have to talk to us like you would talk to your grandmother and hopefully your grandmother doesn't have a PhD in bioengineering, but you have to talk to us. You have to translate, like literally translate your work. Now, if you're at the beginning stages of trying to master that, as I say, don't reinvent the wheel, come to us. That's what we're here for. We are like the canary in the coal mine. We will help you translate your work in terms of making it understandable to a mass audience. Thank you. And uh, just to your point, Kremble does a lot of these um, kind of pitch preparation and training sessions. We get those emails a lot. So for people who want to work more on their science communication skills, definitely check their website out and look out for those emails. Um, so thank you, Christian. I'm just going to read some uh, questions sure. for you at this point. Um, so we have a question. How do you determine what is important to communicate to the general public? Do you look at what's going on in the environment? That's a great question. I mean, look, I, uh, I was a journalist for a long time because I'm a naturally curious person. Uh, I, I, you know, we never stop learning. And, and that's what it translates well, because in science, you never stop learning. You're constantly updating your learning. Um, you know, in terms of what's interesting, I think if you're thinking of uh, uh, the journalistic appetite out there in terms of, the, of media and, and journalism, um, a big factor to keep in mind is so what they will they may not say that in so many words but it's so what what you know how does this relate to patients how does this relate to the healthcare system what's the impact how, it's it's always trying to relate what you're doing to uh how a patient or a family will be impacted by the work you're doing or how you see your work in the future impacting patients we have to always think about relating back to the patient. And I know that can be hard at times, but really that's that's why we're doing the work we do is to impact patients, to impact healthcare. Thank you, Christian. And another question, I think you kind of touched on this too, but uh, what advice do you have for scientists in communicating the right information? That's a good question. I mean, the right information is, you know, again, it's, it's basic stuff. It's uh, to me, like the way I structure the podcast interview is I always start with, I, I have to try and master what each person is doing, which takes a lot of time. So I then reverse engineer what I would like to know or what I think the, the audience out there would like to know. So first of all, we have to set up the problem. What And a lot of you did that today. What is the problem? What's the scope and scale of it in terms of how, how many people does this affect? Uh, what is the burden on the healthcare system, perhaps costs, this kind of thing. And then you want to move into maybe your inspiration of why you do what you do in terms of you decided to put, choose this kind of work or this kind of research. Then tell us about your research. What have you, what did you do? How did you conduct it? What results you have? And then again, at the end, you're relating back to the scope and scale is how will this fix the problem? How will this make things better for patients? And the residual effect hopefully is also maybe it benefits the healthcare system. Thank you, Christian. I think that concludes our uh, audience questions. So are there any last uh, minute thoughts or anything you wanted to maybe mention to our audience? Well, Maybe just one point about this whole notion of, you know, if you're going to accept the challenge, and I know it's a challenge of trying to make your work ex uh, accessible to a wider audience, you do have to commit to your audience. Uh, and, and that means, and look, there's no question it's work. Uh, and you, you have only a limited amount of time in the day. So 
you, you hopefully over time, this is something that you're able to do, but um, you have to understand that the words you use to write grants applications and the words you use to write papers for journals, we don't understand that. We uh, like, uh, it's just not in our vocabulary. It's not relatable to a mass audience. So you have to think about how to translate it. And we always guide people by saying, talk to me like I'm in grade five. Um, and, you know, it, this is not about dumbing down. Uh, Einstein once said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And, and I believe that, you know, the use of clear, simple words over complex ones can actually make you a, more, <laughs> a better scientist or a better communicator. Uh, it's just sometimes it's more intellectually challenging to write clearly. And I get that it's easy to be complex. It's hard to be simple, but if you can, you know, get into that and commit yourself to, I want to be understandable to a mass audience. You may find that you are able to get that. Uh, you may find a, perhaps a, a new funding agency or a new group that's interested in what you do because you were able to make it understandable to them. By and large, I don't think it's, you know, experts in science that are, uh, you know, reading uh, or 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 uh, contributing in terms of funding. I don't know. Uh, so the more understandable you can make it, I think you just you widen the potential for your work to become known. Thank you so much, Christian, uh, for talking to us today. I know uh, you had to rush here, and I'm uh, hearing um, uh, on the background that they need you in the other room uh, that oh, was where do I go? sent to you. Um, <laughs> so uh, check your email and uh, Jenny and the others are waiting for you. Thank you so much for uh, talking to us today. If other people have questions afterwards, they can um, feel free to send them to me and I'll, uh, or connect with Christian um, uh, directly and he'll be happy to answer any of those. Yeah, absolutely. And so at this point in time, I would like to ask if uh, Rabia can share the feedback form. So this is the event feedback form. Any uh, feedback you have about the event, what you want to see more, what you didn't really like, uh, please feel free to let us know. Rabia, just share the Google form again. And um, so thank you so much, Christian. And thank you so much, everybody who helped us put this event together and all of our judges, all of our panelists and um, the trainee executives. So the judges will uh, ha need a little bit more time. Just so you know, the Twitter challenge winner and the uh, uh, People's Choice Award winner are all determined. We're just waiting for the judges to uh, come up with the first, second and third place. Uh, meanwhile, please take your time. It's a very short questionnaire. It's just five or six questions. Uh, we want to know your feedback. We want to know what you felt about the event today. I see some uh, comments in the chat box. Thank you, Lazar and Salak and uh, Emily. Uh, but um, let, let us know uh, what we can do better and what you want to see more. And to uh, Christian's point, for all of you uh, trainees here and junior scientists especially, if you need resources to work on your communication skills, uh, you don't have to, you know, uh, put that all of that burden on yourself. If you're committed enough and you're passionate about it, there are a lot of good resources at UHN, at Kite. We usually try to uh, we usually try to uh, provide these workshops, but there's a lot of other things on the internet too. Twitter. Um, other universities, that, especially U of T, they share a lot of good uh, communication resources. So uh, definitely feel free to check those out. But if you wanted something more specific, uh, feel free to email me and Jenny. We're usually looking at uh, some of the gaps in so uh, somewhere we can, uh, where we can uh, provide more resources and more workshops. So definitely feel free to reach to me or Jenny or to your trainee executive committee, they are very committed to providing all the trainees with the resources they need to excel in their research. So feel free to do that. I'm seeing some, um, some good feedback uh, in the chat box. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shumit, Behrang, everybody. Um, so if you can just wait on for a few more minutes, hopefully all our judges will be back and with the final results. And um, yeah, so uh, take this minute maybe to um, fill out our questionnaire. Um, Rabia, can you actually send it again? Uh, because I know that people are um, commenting and sometimes it moves up. 
So if you can just take a moment to let us know how we did and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes shortly.
Um, just an update from the judges um, side. They're uh, almost done. Uh, they have two of the awards. Uh, they know about it and they're debating on one of the others. So they're coming to a conclusion on that. So uh, please stay with us a little bit more. I know that there's a training session after this, uh, the training networking session. So I know some of you have, um, have registered to do the networking session and um, it's gonna start in a few minutes after we have the uh, awards announced. So uh, just bear with us a little bit more and then you can also uh, go afterwards and join the uh, networking session. So uh, we have the Twitter Challenge Award, we have the People's Choice, and uh, in just a few minutes, we'll have all the other results back to you, and hopefully we can wrap it up. Thank you. I see that Jeff is back. Okay. Question is coming on. Jenny. And I know Elisa wants to announce the awards. So. Yes. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I didn't have a chance to, we haven't had a chance to rename ourselves. Um, Thank you for your patience. Uh, it was very close. Um, I wasn't involved in the judging, but I was uh, I was uh, sort of uh, reviewing and moderating the uh, the deliberations. So I can tell you that that the the judges had a really hard time picking the winners because everyone uh, was so phenomenal. Um, now Elisa uh, has the results in hand, and she is logging back in. So she is collecting her thoughts. I see her appearing now. It's all very suspenseful. So in a moment, uh, we're going to turn it over to Elisa. She is going to announce the third place, second place, and first place winners of the live competition. And then Miriam is going to announce the winners of the People's Choice Award for the live stream and also the Twitter presentation award. So with no further ado, uh, Elisa. Okay, um, thank you so much. This is awesome to be the person to announce them. Um, okay, so in, I don't remember the prizes though, so I apologize for that. So I'll just say the people's names. Um, so in third place, we have Robert Novoshelsky. In second place, we have Sharon Gabison. And in first place, we have Shilpa Jacob. Okay, thank you, Elisa. Uh, congratulations, everybody. So I just wanted, uh, when uh, Elisa said she didn't have the numbers, I saw that I don't have the numbers either. So I'm just gonna read the numbers. The third place uh, is $200 uh, monetary award. And uh, the second place is $400. And the first place is $500. And now I have the privilege to announce our winners. For the Twitter challenge, Ramtin Mujtahedi, he won the Twitter challenge. Congratulations, Ramtin. I, I, I saw you in the attendees. So the Twitter challenge award is also $200. And uh, for the People's Choice Award, so that one, um, yeah, so and, and Andrea Bendini. Uh, his, the title of his presentation, a wearable video based system for measuring hand use after cervical spinal cord injury in people living in the community. So again, uh, congratulations, Andrea. And then again, um, the monetary award for this one is also $200. So congratulations, all of our winners and all of the people who participated. Um, I know that um, the Twitter challenge was closed and all of the judges were kind of deliberating for a long time. So thank you so much for preparing these great presentations uh, and I'll hand it over to Jenny for final remarks. Thank you so much. I'm gonna get you to stop sharing your screen, Miriam. And 
I'd like to ask the, uh, the winners um, who are all uh, hopefully present, except perhaps the um, Ramton, I'm sure can't share his video because he's an attendee. Um, but could we get... Um, I, Ramton, I promoted Ramton to panelists. So oh, perfect. Can... Okay, so Ramton, if you can show us on your video and all the awards winners, excellent. There we go. Okay, so a uh, big round of applause for all of you. It was really a phenomenal event. Everyone did fantastic. Essentially, everybody's a winner, um, but you guys um, clearly made an impression on the judges and the people. Uh, so congratulations to Andrea. Oh, we, Andrea, we can't, you're blocked off in red. It looks like maybe you're covering your camera. There we go, now we can see you and Ramton. Um, there, okay, we can see you on the video. But anyways, thank you so, so much. Thank you to all of the attendees for making this event uh, so successful. Thank you again to all the organizers, especially um, Miriam and Saya and Rebea and the entire trainee executive committee. Uh, thank you also to our reviewers and our esteemed judges. Um, so with that, I will call a close to the inaugural three minute trainee uh, competition. And I will pass it along to uh, Saya to uh, coordinate uh, the next part of the evening, which is um, the networking session. For, so for those of you who are signing off, thank you. Have a good afternoon. And for those of you who are sticking around, we look forward to chatting more. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Yeah. Rabia, I think Saya went to the other Zoom meeting. Is that true? Yes, uh, we have the networking session on another Zoom link. So I think she has forwarded the link to all of the participants and mentors. Uh, but just let me know if you haven't received that. Congratulations, everybody. Um, congratulations. Great well, presentations, there. yeah. I didn't, I have to go back and watch some of them because I was uh, moderating the second half and I couldn't really focus, but uh, it was great. Thank you. And, and also the Twitter challenge was pretty close. Yeah. We we're counting numbers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations to everyone. Congratulations. Um, Jenny, you're muted. I better go network. Okay. Yes. <laughs> you guys there. Thank, thank you, you so much. It was thank great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.